Well, thank you, Aaron. Although, don't let Aaron fool you into thinking that I'm an expert in all of those topics. I just work on a variety of different things from time to time. Okay, so um, so what I want to thank you very much for inviting me to a joint colloquium here. It's excellent to be back. I was here, I think it was in '99 when Chris McKee was visiting, uh, but only very briefly. Um, so it's excellent to be back. And I want to talk today about uh, the deaths of stars. And so I've titled it Investment Advice for Star Destroyers, but I'm really not speaking about the cover slide here. I'm talking about uh, work that I, um, I'm coming back to after a couple decades of having thought about in the past and becoming interested in again. And so my recent collaborators include some graduate students at the University of Toronto, Stephen Rowe, Pega Salbi, and Milu Afsari. I misspelled her name, Afsari, uh, as well as my um, Australian collaborator, Yuri Levin, uh, with whom I work from time to time. And the topic here is the destruction of stars by core collapse. And so what I want to talk about um, as a, in a sort of cartoon picture is the, um, the, the explosion of a star uh, following the collapse of a core. So as we all know, what we're talking about is a, is a massive star that is burnt through its uh, nuclear fuel, built up a, a massive degenerate core, which then collapses. And through one mechanism or another, the by almost magic, it seems, the, uh, the gravitational collapse of the core it releases energy, which is then caught by the envelope and becomes an explosion. And so uh, what I want to focus on in particular is the dynamics of the explosion and the phenomenon of the, the moment at which an observer can first see the explosion from afar with a, with a photon telescope. Um, the moment at which the uh, explosion breaches the surface of the star and casts material out at high speed into the surface of our universe. So um, this is important for a variety of reasons, especially in an age where we're getting um, more and more ability to view the sky at high cadence um, in the X-ray and optical and infrared, because um, this this event at the surface of the star is critical to uh, a flash of photons, which is visible from afar. It's, um, it sets, the, sets in motion the highest velocity flows that emerge from the explosion, which uh, then travel out into the region around the star and run into um, any material which was previously there, creating earliest phases of a supernova remnant, and also the earliest phase of the supernova light curve itself, because before the, uh, nu the decay of radioactive elements comes to dominate the glow of this expanding ball of ejecta, what you have in the very earliest phases are high velocity is the high velocity material thrown into motion by a shock front just as it was about to breach the surface of the star. Okay. So that's the context. Um, what, I, what I want to do is, first of all, tell you a little bit about the dynamics. Uh, in a simple uh, picture, describe how you can understand the dynamics of one of these explosions from simple simulation. Um, and then I want to explain that there's a certain amount of tension between the simplest sort of plain vanilla model that you can that you can construct this way, and some of the more interesting transients that have been observed in recent years, and uh, ask the question: if you if you have to challenge yourself to to explain those more interesting transients, what can you do to take a simple model for the explosion of a star and get the most uh, bang for your buck, the maximal yield that you can get out of one of these uh, events. And I'll come up with a few solutions or, or strategies for dealing with the challenges posed by those, those observations 
uh, first within spherical models, but then it's much more interesting uh, and productive to look at non-spherical explosions, which, um, which uh, evade some of the constraints that you have in terms of spherical models. So then I'll talk about non-spherical explosions and show, first of all, that they are much more productive when it comes to the, um, to the events that happen at the emergence of a shock. And secondly, that there are sort of unexpected phenomena that are almost unavoidable when you have a, um, a shock breaching the surface of a star in a non-spherical way, which leads to a new type of um, a new type emission event. And so I'll summarize with uh, the, the different ways that you can uh, invest your energy and, and mass most wisely to get Okay, so to start off, it's the, um, the question of the dynamics of an explosion. And there's a very simple picture here, which is that there are really two governing rules for the explosion of a spherical object. So if I, if I, um, if I take a stellar model, this is a blue supergiant model for supernova 1987A from Ken Minoka. And I say, well, the innermost region of this model is going to collapse and launch an explosion through the rest of it. Um, and after some narrow range or transition region, this explosion will be essentially uh, adiabatic, um, mostly radiation pressure dominated, and gravity will become uh, less and less important as you go towards the outside of the star then really you're just dealing with a very simple situation where you are dropping a bomb into a spherical density structure. So just to explain, this is a plot of the logarithm of density versus uh, stellar mass going up to 16 solar masses in this blue supergiant progenitor. And one of the interesting things that you see on this plot about the um, initial conditions for stellar explosions is that there are regions of various composition separated by uh, burning shells. So you have an iron core, an, an inner mantle, a carbon ox uh, that's a helium envelope, carbon oxygen envelope, and uh, an hydrogen envelope on the outside in this case. And so um, the, the first rule to keep in mind is that the overall evolution of the shock motion which is what matters for the phenomena at the outside of the star, is governed by the um, overall governed by the overall um, energy conservation of the explosion. So if I've set off a bomb in the middle with a certain energy and it's sweeping up a mass increasing its radius, then there has to be a, a general deceleration just due to energy conservation, the shock velocity, and it's non-relativistic to drop like the square root of energy divided by the mass that it swept, swept through at that point. Um, and that, that scaling is familiar, for instance, from the set off Taylor blast wave. Um, and, uh, but that's not the whole story. So that's, that's the beginning of the story. This is a one over square root of enclosed mass, uh, ignoring the, the collapsed remnant. That's, that's phase A here, but the second, the second factor here is very important for the outside of the star. And that's a, that's a different effect, which is uh, a lot like the crack of a whip. Um, the shock will accelerate as it runs through density regions which are smaller than the mean density that it's already run through um, by this factor that goes like density to the about the minus 0.19 power. And that's not a rational power. It's not exactly 0.19. It depends a slightly on the density um, on the density structure as does this coefficient. But basically, it is a an eigenvalue of a self-similar problem that has to do with a shock running through a strongly declining density structure towards a zero density. Um, and this gives you basically a, a density to the minus one fifth acceleration of the speed of the shock which is very important as you go towards the outside of the star. So if you add that factor on, you get um, this product, which declines generally as one over the square root of the mass, but then goes up again in regions where there's a strong decline of the density. And basically, wherever the density is dropping off um, faster than radius to the minus three, 
so that this factor can, um, can lead to an acceleration. And this formula, sorry, was there a question? So this formula um, is, is pretty good. I'll show you the, um, the evidence that it's pretty good. Um, here's one example. So this is a, um, a comparison. I've, I, the, the formula is actually a dotted line that you can barely see, so I've put a, um, a red highlight on top of it. The n there's a numerical solution for the shock velocity relative to a sort of characteristic scale um, as it runs through a m the mass in a similar uh, stellar structure. Um, a numerical solution is this slightly ratty uh, solid line here. And they essentially touch one another. They're, they're the approximation is good to a few percent. Um, here are some other approximations that are in the literature that I just put on to, um, to make fun of. But, um, but uh, it the this very simple formula does a pretty good job at ex describing the evolution of the speed of an explosion. And, um, and that's very important because it gives us a way to understand the speed at which the shock is going to travel as it, as it uh, breaches the outer, ex the outer reaches of the stellar envelope. No, this is this is a this is a, um, a different progenitor and one. I'll show you a better example of this in a moment. This is a different progenitor and one in which that acceleration is happening, but it's uh, confined to a small region in mass at, at the outer reaches of the envelope. It's not a small region in weight. So um, the next thing to say uh, is that that formula breaks down in certain situations. Um, one way that it breaks down uh, that uh, is useful to know about is that it doesn't uh, correctly describe the shock velocity if there's more than one shock in the system. So if the shock accelerates too rapidly, produces supersonic flow, which then has to decelerate in a, in a, in a region outside of it, then you can have a forward reverse shock structure form and that formula will break down. Um, another way that it breaks down is a f is, uh, has to do with the physics of the medium. So the, the, the physical conditions in the explosion of a stellar envelope are highly radiation pressure dominated, especially in the outer reaches of, um, of, of supernova envelopes. And so the structure of the shock front, the shock is not in fact infinitesimal, it has a finite width. And the width of the shock has to do in the, it by, can be understood by going into the, to the frame of the shock and looking at the flow of fluid from a cold upstream material to hot downstream and balancing that against the diffusion of photons upstream through the shock front. And the balance of those two effects gives you an optical depth across the shock, which is, a sh which is a, an electron scattering optical depth, which is about the speed of light divided by the shock velocity. And there's a particular form that you can, that you can uh, estimate the shock will have um, as it's propagating. But the important thing to realize is that this shock optical depth is generally small as you're traveling over stellar envelopes. But as you approach the surface of a star, um, and more so if the star is more extended, this optical depth becomes uh, large compared with the optical depth if you have less outside of your location. So that provides a natural end to the acceleration of the shock front. And that's what produces both an, an initial outburst of photons, because that's what leads to these photons within the shock being em emitted to the observer. And it's also what determines the upper limit of the um, the upper limit of the velocity in the fastest ejecta that, that are spat away from the supernova explosion. It's also the case that this diffusion of photons will then um, move inward relative to the mass shells, outward in radius, as the, uh, as the ejecta expand. And it's that early phase of the supernova light curve that gives you all of these effects are, are um, functions of the explosion energy and the radius of the star, and they give you information about the progenitor, which is very hard to get from, uh, from observations of the, of, the, of the peak of the supernova light curve that depend upon the deep material. Yeah, so the, um, 
the, the, the point to, s to, to make at this point is that essentially everything about the, um, the breaching of the stellar surface within this simple toy model of the explosion is given to you, to go back to my formula, is given to you by simple combination of, of properties of the explosion, energy, mass, radius, as well as some information about the opacity and optical depth of the material in the outer envelope, which then, um, which then provide the outburst effect and the upper limit to the uh, ejector speed. Okay, so one thing to uh, realize is that if conditions are right, then the shock can continue to accelerate beyond, um, beyond the point at which it becomes relativistic. So I wrote down a non-relativistic form of that system. And in fact, um, there are situations where the formula I wrote down will give you velocities higher than the speed of light. And there's a particular way in which the motion of the shock transitions from a, rel from a non-relativistic uh, acceleration law to a relativistic acceleration. And as long as that's happening at the outside of the star, as opposed to the inside or somewhere in the middle, you can, um, you can uh, basically take the formula I gave you as a function of the final Lorentz factor, of the, of the shock Lorentz factor as it's traveling through the material. There's a change in the dynamic that I um, should tell you about. The, um, the, the non-relativistic dynamic say that when a piece of material is struck by the shock front, it's, it will accelerate after being hit by the shock to a speed which is about twice the speed of the shock when it gets, when it gets to that location. Um, whereas once the shock becomes relativistic, which can only happen if the optical depth is high enough, if the photons don't break up, once the shock becomes relativistic, the, you can no longer double the speed of the, of the shock to get to the final velocity of that mass shell. Instead, there's a, a relativistic acceleration, which leads to the final Lorentz factor being a power of the initial Lorentz factor in this terminal phase of acceleration at the outside of the star. Okay, so, um, so the end product of all this is a distribution of energy with speed. A uh, distribution of kinetic energy faster than some velocity versus velocity or Lorentz factor. And so combined here on this plot in terms of the product of uh, gamma beta, the four velocity, spatial vo four velocity of the, of the ejecta as it's traveling away from the star. And here in a, in a paper with Tan and McKee, what I'm plotting is a distribution of, um, of energy with, with, uh, with final four velocity. In the non-relativistic regime, it's, it declines quite steeply because of, the, because of the acceleration law that I showed you earlier. And so that gives you a drop off of energy with, with velocities, about velocities to the minus six. And then the, the relativistic acceleration is, uh, is much shallower because of the relativistic shock acceleration, post-shock acceleration. It leads to a drop off of energy with Lorentz factor, which is about one over the final so this is actually, um, this is uh, the, the logarithm of the kinetic energy in the ejecta relative to the rest energy of the explosion. So, so um, and, the, and the labels of the different curves correspond to the total energy of the explosion relative to the rest energy of, of, the, of, the, of the material that's being blown. So um, there are a variety of, uh, of different supernova and more energetic explosions that you can map out to these, uh, to these curves. Which one are we talking about? Yeah, so this is energy of the explosion relative to rest energy of the material that's being blown. Yes, and so the vertical axis is the kinetic energy relative to the rest as a logarithm. So this, um, these curves show you basically how much energy you have to work with, and they also show you that there is a, uh, a strong penalty to going to high velocities relative to the um, characteristic velocity of your overall explosion 
the efficiency of producing high velocity ejecta is down by this uh, d to the minus 5.2 factor. So you get the lowest distribution. Um, there are a few different types of, of events that you can associate with this breakout thing. Um, so I think it was first observationally uh, inferred to have happened in the case of supernova 1987A, not by direct observations, but by observations of the uh, rings around the explosion site, where the ionization state in those rings required ionization by, uh, by far ultraviolet or um, extreme ultraviolet or soft X-ray photons as opposed to the light of the, uh, of the supernova light curve itself. The, uh, the rest of the optical light curve of the supernova would not have produced the ionization state of those rings. And then um, in, the, in the 22 or so years since that explosion, there's been a collision between the highest velocity ejecta and the ring material that has lit up uh, those rings in optical and X-ray. Um, in the case of supernova 1993J, here's uh, JLBI images from Diefenholz of an expanding shell of synchrotron emission coming from the highest velocity ejecta running into a circumstellar medium, um, which illustrates the production of that material at the outside of the star. Um, and I should mention that there are some interesting uh, phenomena that may occur in, these, in this interaction, uh, especially for relativistic ejecta, such as the production of uh, high energy cosmic rays and also the spallation of nuclei to produce light elements like lithium, beryllium, and boron um, as, that, as relativistic ejecta run into uh, stellar wind material outside of the star. So those are sort of standard uh, phenomena that are associated with this type of ionization. But I want to, oh no, it, it never was. It never was. Its, it's, its properties didn't produce a, an upper limit for the ejector speed, which are, which are not relativistic. There was a shock breakout in the corridor, according to Schwartz, which was relativistic. And that had to do with the overall energy scale of the explosion and also the, the radius of the blue super dense ejector. So, but now I want to talk, turn to some of the more interesting events that, um, that are somewhat in tension with the simple model. And um, first of all, there are, uh, there are types of events which are possibly powered by the interaction of these fast ejecta with, um, with a dense medium that emits the star. So there are superluminous supernovae, which um, are significantly overluminous compared with normal supernovae. And one of the three hypotheses for these events that I know of involves the interaction of a large amount of material surrounding the star <coughs> with the expanding ejecta so that a large amount of the kinetic energy of the, the ejecta can be tapped to power the, the light curve itself. So this is, sorry, it's, it's hard to read. This is, this is uh, V magnitude, absolute, absolute, yes, luminosity versus time. So that's going from zero days to 120 days. This is also luminosity versus time. Different, so different, different colors are, are many different superluminous supernovae. And uh, each color is, is, is one of those, uh, each color image symbol is one of those events. Um, here is, I think, a single superluminous, a, a single rapid optical transient. So not many of them overplotted on top of each other. Again, magnitude versus time. This is a separate type of, of optical transient event that was found in the PANSTAR survey. And they look, they, they rise and decline more rapidly than, um, than thermonuclear powered uh, supernova light curves. And they look as though they may in fact be especially bright versions of the breakout flash and early, um, early light curve of a supernova driven by shock motion through the star with a particularly small amount of thermonuclear uh, energy release to, to make them brighter at, at late times so that they look uh, 
could just say it's all death. So that's another uh, a type of event which wasn't essentially wasn't really expected. But um, the the type of events which uh, are most um, demanding are the low luminosity gamma ray bursts, which look as though they are likely to be um, a product of relativistic shock emission. So here's an example, a prototype, prototypical example of that. This is the first supernova gamma ray burst coincidence, supernova 1998BW. This is coincident with the gamma ray burst seen on April 25th of 1998. And um, this happened in a low redshift uh, galaxy. Um, and it showed, it was, a, it was a dim gamma ray burst because, because it was so close and not especially bright in the gamma ray as is seen by BASTI. Um, so that it had an isotropic emission of only 10 to the 48 ergs in, in gamma rays. But it came from a supernova that was modeled as having 30 times the characteristic energy for a supernova. So this is a, an example of a, um, of a broad line class of the stiff envelope supernovas, or type 1, B, and C supernovas of supernovae without hydrogen. And a subclass of them shows broad lines corresponding to especially high uh, ejective velocity at their photospheres when the, when the spectra is taken. And uh, this uh, event came from, its dim gamma ray burst came from a particularly energetic supernova. And um, it also shows uh, characteristics that are very different from the cosmological bright gamma ray bursts, the long gamma ray bursts uh, at cosmological distances. Um, it shows a cutoff at high photon energies above 300 keV. It shows a smooth rise and fall. Um, and these two characteristics, along with the low energy of the event, mean that it does not require a highly relativistic jet um, to be beaming at the observer, which is required in the case of uh, the cosmological gamma ray burst. So this is plausibly a, um, a potentially even spherical, uh, moderate Lorentz factor flow that led to this, this gamma ray event. So um, in an effort to understand this, it was proposed to be a, um, a shock breakout phenomenon uh, when it was first observed uh, by Sri Kulkarni and, and collaborators. And in an effort to um, understand it, uh, my collaborators and I modeled it. So this is the same model that I showed you earlier of, of relativistic shock acceleration, but plotted in terms of, again, um, energy relative, uh, sorry, this is kinetic energy in terms of uh, ergs. So this is 10 to the 48, 10 to the 49, 10 to the 50 ergs. The, ob the observation in gamma rays was about 10 to the 48 ergs. And what we found in, that in, the, in the model that I showed you earlier is a um, distribution of kinetic energy which could produce the uh, energetics of the gamma ray burst in material that was only mildly relativistic, gamma beta just over one. So in that case, it looked as though it was plausible that um, some phenomenon from shock emergence at the surface of the star, maybe uh, the photon outburst or a circumstellar interaction between the ejecta and material around the star could have given rise to the actual burst. But in the time since then, there have been a number of these um, low luminosity gamma ray bursts. And although that model seemed to work reasonably well in the, in the case that, that we had, where we simply took the stellar model that explained the, the light curve of the explosion and applied it to the production of relativistic ejecta. Um, events have happened since then which stretch the, the, um, stretch the energetics of that model pretty, pretty strongly. So in particular, this event from 2006, supernova 06AJ, which was gamma ray burst 060218, so I guess it was on February 18th, of 2006, um, it has a gamma ray energy of, of close to 10 to the 50 ergs coming out in a, uh, an observed duration of a, of a couple thousand seconds. And this requires um, a much more 
potent production of high, uh, of moderately relativistic material, um, especially if you associate the duration of the event with um, the light crossing time of a stellar progenitor, which then has to be very extended and, um, and makes you wonder about the, uh, the um, truncation of acceleration by, by low optical depth as they cross into the color line. Yeah. Right, so it's, yes, yes. So um, this, let's look at the rest of them. This is, ten to the, this is luminosity in 10 to the 42 orgs per second in an, e an X-ray band. And then um, the, the right one is a count rate uh, for uh, 30. Yes, indeed. I believe this is the count rate. Let me check again. Yeah, sorry. It is two different supernovas. I should have. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll let you know. Yeah. OK, so. Um, so uh, the, these low luminosity gamma ray bursts um, are interesting. They are not that infrequent, in fact. If you compare the rate, which is a couple hundred per gigaparsec, cubic gigaparsecs per year, um, which is much higher than the cosmological long gamma ray uh, burst rate, which is on the order of one per cubic gigaparsec per year. If you compare that couple hundred to the to the event rate of the broadline type 1 B and C supernovae, these, these high velocity stiff envelope supernovae that are the progenitors uh, of those events, it's not that much lower, um, maybe within a factor of, of a few or possibly 10, if, since these numbers are uncertain. But um, this implies that these bursts are probably uh, not that uncommon and therefore cannot be highly beamed. Because if they were highly beamed, then um, then there should be a big factor between the burst rate and the and the rate of explosions, even if every single explosion contains one of the bursts. Sorry, the big factor would be basically the um, the, the sky fraction of the pi that you you can show if one of the bursts. Um, if a factor of 10, it might be possible. I think this is, I mean, this, these numbers are different only by a factor of two, but they're both uncertain. Yeah. OK, well, so, so yeah, the question, Yeah. Okay. Well, that's fair enough. So it's it's definitely worth looking at the at the at the rate. Um, there are other pieces of evidence that indicate that there is not a uh, a highly beamed event going on. So um, there have been searches in the radio for the afterglows of relativistic jets that are propagating out into a stellar wind nature. Um, and so this is an example from Alicia Soderberg in 2006, looking as time after the explosion at the luminosity of these events in the radio band, and showing, comparing the uh, light curves in the radio with models for a relativistic jet, which then decelerates and beams into a wider and wider area of the sky. So you should see a late time brightening if you're looking at an event which is not pointed at. And those, those late time brightenings have not been seen. And they've been, the lack of detection has been turned into um, constraints on the parameters of these models, which involve the efficiency of producing, um, the, the efficiency of producing magnetic fields to, to generate superstrong radiation, and the uh, density or mass free net radius in the stellar wind. And the characteristic ranges of, um, of parameters are more or less ruled out in many of the cases. So it looks as though there's no evidence for emission from, a, um, from a, an off-axis jet giving rise to a low luminosity gamma ray burst. Um, furthermore, it 
It could be that these low luminosity events are simply a tail of the cosmological high luminosity gamma ray burst distribution. But um, the distribution in terms of redshift and luminosity um, is indicative of a two peak structure, which would suggest that they are not, in fact, the same thing as the high luminosity gamma ray burst. And if they're not, it would, it would uh, speak in favor of a model in which they come from a different um, emission mechanism, such as something associated with, um, with shot breakup. The problem, of course, is that in order to, um, in order to power events like the 2006 event, like this event here, um, if you look at the kinetic energy versus velocity of these events, comparing the low luminosity gamma ray burst sample with the high luminosity gamma ray burst sample, which go up to much higher Lorentz factors, and comparing them to normal uh, type 1b and c supernovae, they have a sort of intermediate um, distribution of, eject of ejecta ener kinetic energy, which, um, which you have to explain. And this um, plot was made to argue that because they don't show the the uh, uh, something like the b to the minus 5.2 drop off in kinetic energy, that they must be powered by a different source, perhaps late um, late engine activity of the sensor object. But um, in fact, you could also view it as saying that if you look at the curves that I showed you earlier, they simply represent a higher uh, a higher velocity explosion, and one in which the relativistic transition happens between the low velocity observations and the high velocity observations, which were taken from the early radioactive layer. This is, this is a combination of different observations. The high velocity points are, are coming mainly from radio constraints, I think, and the low velocity points are coming from photospheric observations. Each line is a single explosion, and it has a low velocity point and a high velocity point. And so the slope on this curve is being compared with the distribution of ejecta kinetic energy in the, in the simple model that I showed you to make an argument about what type of, what type of event you're looking at. It's the way it's being interpreted. Uh, what's actually measured is a radio light curve in the case of these events, and then it's being passed through um, modeling of the of synchrotron images to determine the kinetic energy that had to power the, the radio light curve. Yeah, 10 to the 52 ergs. Um, so for instance, the explosion I told you about gamma ray burst or the supernova 98DW was um, powered by about 30 times the ordinary supernova energy. So that's 3 times 10 to the 52 ergs. So that's the overall energy of the explosion. And so that would be the left kinetic energy. Um, well, that's true. So this event would be pushing the bounds of um, the bounds of likelihood, but these events are more plausible in terms of slope and displacement. Events depends on how much mass you you um, you uh, associate with your ejection. So on that point, let me just explain that um, in sort of the time that um, these observations have been taken. Uh, it's been proposed that some of these um, low luminosity gamma ray bursts are, in fact, the outcome of the sh photon breakout of a shock at the stellar surface. Um, that uh, model has been applied most successfully by Ehud Matar and, and Ram Sari, um, who simply say, let's take, for instance, uh, an explosion that produces 2 times 10 to the 50 ergs in material traveling at about a Lorentz factor of 1.2 and see what the photon shot breakout would look like and what the early radio af and x-ray afterglow would be like. 
So they're able to reproduce the energetics of the, of the gamma ray burst using those parameters, but the parameters are quite extreme. So this is an example of uh, an application of the model to the radio afterglow as a, a in time as one day, 10 day, 100 days, and, and Mike Rajansky is a flux for the 2006 event. What you see is that the model fits quite well in the radio, and there's, an, there's a significant excess of x-rays, but it basically fits the optical and x-ray, uh, well, I shouldn't say optical, it fits the, it fits the early x-rays, it fits the late time radio, and there's an excess of late x-rays. And so it seems to hold together quite well, but you have to appeal to a very high energy at very high, um, very high speeds. So essentially, you have to take uh, an explosion and, and convert a large fraction of its, of its input energy into, into high velocity measurements. Yeah, so the size of the star is related to the total, um, the, the duration and total energy of the photon emitter. And so in this case, the star, star has to be a few hundred kilorradii in size, which you would ordinarily say would um, violate the constraint that the um, shock doesn't accelerate once it's, its optical jet starts too low. But in this case, there's so much energy that it actually does. Okay, so let's, given that that does work, let's ask ourselves how, do, how would we meet this difficult challenge of um, producing an explosion with those energetics at those speeds. So in other words, given uh, a certain ejected mass and some explosion energy, how do you combine them together to produce the brightest flash, the most, the most uh, energy in especially high relative, high velocity ejecta, such as relative excitability. Okay, so in, a, in the context of a spherical explosion, according to the formula I showed you earlier, you really have only two options. There's this factor and that factor. And what you're trying to do is to enhance the shock velocity and as much of the mass of the outermost reaches of the star as possible. And um, the first thing to do would be to increase the overall velocity scale of the explosion. So to work with a particularly high energy and a particularly low amount of envelope mass in this star. Um, of course, if I just told you that you had to work within a certain budget of energy and mass, then you can't really touch this factor. And then your only option is to, uh, is to change the density distribution of the outside of the star. Okay, so let me just um, apply this formula to, to tell you what you get out of it in terms of relativistic ejecta if you take a, a pretty healthy explosion um, as your input. So in order to get relativistic flow at the outside of the star for a typical electron scattering opacity, you need your star to be less than about 500 kiloradii given a very healthy input of energy. So I've put in 30 times more energy than a typical supernova and only into about one solar mass of ejected material. So if you're willing to work with this particularly high velocity scale, then you, you can have relativistic flow at the surface of a, of a very extended star. And this leads to a very bright photon output. You still have this density factor, which is about density to the minus one six. So by suppressing the density, in the outer reaches of the star, you can help yourself out a bit. Um, the energetics in this case are, again, similar to the 2006 event, about 10 to the 50 erg, as long as you're willing to work with this particularly energetic explosion in a relatively low mass of ejecta. So how can you, how can you evade the constraint of requiring such a high velocity scale for the explosion? If you, if you are trying to get some uh, returns out of that density factor, then um, your, your, your best bet is to suppress the density in the outermost reaches of the star. And um, it's, it's going to help somewhat because, um, because the factor is there. However, the power on that factor is only about one sixth. So, um, so you can, uh, get a little bit of mileage out of uh, reducing the density in the outermost zones of the star. And this occurs naturally as a result of the iron line opacity 
in the um, in these envelopes, because of the because of the effective temperature ranges of the stars that are involved, the iron group elements uh, have a peak and opacity in the outer outermost stellar envelope, which leads to essentially Eddington luminosity in these regions, which in a hydrostatic model leads to an inflation of the of the stellar progenitor. So this is a wolf rayet progenitor from Grafner et al. And in this hydrostatic model, you see this inflated shelf, this shelf of the in the density profile, and even this uh, really paler, unstable peak in density near the stellar surface, which I don't believe any more than you do, but it is uh, part of the model. Um, so I asked my student Stephen to look into um, into non-hydrostatic models given these. Uh, given the opacity of the iron line. And here are some examples of stellar wind models that he's produced, which, um, which we're only able to integrate out a certain distance, but these form sonic points in, in the stellar envelope down around the base of that density shelf, places where the, where the iron line opacities are becoming a few, uh, relatively strong. And then they also produce a, uh, a profile of density, which is in fact a um, outflowing uh, density distribution, but looks a lot otherwise like the in inflated stellar envelope. So one way to produce, yeah. Oh, so you simply need to produce a, um, a mass loss rate that's able to, that has a, a shock, op sorry, so the shock optical depth has to be greater than unity. Basically, any continuum-driven outflow will contain the shock out to the point where it becomes um, becomes relativistic, because you simply have to have an electron scattering optical depth bigger than unity in order for that to be relevant. So all of these profiles have that feature. Um, okay, so that's one way to glean a little bit of return on investment by extending the star, uh, either hydrostatically. There, there. Uh, a few thousand kilometers per second. So there's escape speeds from the star that we can uh, that we can apply. Um, a second way of 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 uh, gleaning a bit more um, mileage out of your stellar profile in these spherical models is to have a invest a little bit of your energy before the main explosion in a in a precursor event. Um, precursor events that have been seen in uh, supernova 2006 JC, two years before the explosion, and in uh, another, um, in, in a couple other cases, uh, in this case, 40 days before the explosion. Um, what a precursor event will do is to, is to sh uh, cast off a bit of material from the surface of the star, producing a, an extended hydrostatic structure as well as an outflowing distribution of material. Um, and so what you need to have a precursor event is basically to have a, um, a, a burp from the stellar interior, which is strong enough to pass through an acoustic turning point near the outside of the star. And if it does so, it will turn into a shock, which then strengthens down the, um, down the density gradient. So this is an example in terms of, this is logarithmic density versus log radius in a simulation by my student, Stephen Rowe. And um, is it happening? Yes, it's happening. So, um, so essentially, what you saw is a small explosion launched at the cer at the center of the of the star, leading to a distribution of low velocity ejecta, which can and as well as a hydrostatic um, extension of the envelope, and in the spherical model, a lot of wiggling, which um, which can then be uh, a uh, fertile ground for the shock acceleration. That's right. It was it was in fact just a polytropic initial explosion, which would dump some energy out. Um, so, okay. So that that buys you something, but the problem is that there, if you're if you are not are not giving yourself the option of changing the energy and mass of the explosion, you really only get to work with this density factor, which comes in at a low power. So it doesn't buy you that much in terms of the overall. Experience. What gets you some real mileage um, is to imagine that you're dealing with a non-spherically symmetric event, which is perfectly reasonable 
basically all of the successful models for explosions coming out of collapse have significant asymmetries, either in terms of uh, standard accretion shock, um, instability, or rotation leading to magnetic energy release, or in the case of um, in the case of the long gamma ray burst, probably rotating infall onto a black hole, or rotation interacting with uh, nuclear burning. And in fact, we know in the case of am I running? Okay. And we know in the case of uh, long gamma ray bursts that um, that a stellar that a jet has to pierce the stellar envelope and emit at the observer. So this is something that Omer Bromberg has been working on. Here's a simplified description of how this works. Basically, um, you can you can balance uh, momentum fluxes at the head of this jet to determine how rapidly the jet is going to expand through the stellar envelope. And it gives you a constraint which, simply put, says that if your jet doesn't last forever, then the star can contain it. Especially an extended star can contain a jet that doesn't last longer than the, for instance, the free fall time of the, of the core. So, um, so by having an extended envelope around your your collapsing core, you can contain the jet and, and develop a non-spherically symmetric um, explosion. OK, so how does that help? What it really helps you to do is to put your energy into a smaller fraction of the envelope, then thereby increasing the, the pre factor on everything, which leads to a uh, much more energetic outburst of energy. So here is a um, here's a simulation of this um, of this phenomenon by uh, my student Nilu Afsari, um, and here's a pressure distribution on the left and density distribution in a simple polytropic stellar model in which a a, a bipolar explosion is going to be um, released. What happens though, like in many uh, explosion simulations, is you have an outburst. And I've stopped the simulation here to show you what's happening in the middle of it. So um, what you've just seen is an explosion traveling out through the star and leading to an energetic outburst at the poles. Basically, putting the investing energy in a small fraction of the, of the envelope mass, leading to an, a larger, more energetic outburst at the poles than would be otherwise possible. But some. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, there is probably this is actually stellar radii. This is n this is solar radii. So this is not our friend of the week. <laughs> actually, well, you know the the solution the the, the simulation so the simulation is scale free. So it actually sorry you're wrong. It's it's one centimeter star. Um, but. So the NSRTP in this case was put in by hand. It was a spherical explosion in which we um, introduced a, a momentum, uh, a bipolar momentum to, to make it um, NSSI. So other similar simulations have been done which drive a jet from the stellar core for a certain period of time and then stop before it breaches, the jet breaches the surface. So uh, The outside density is just 16 or less. So. Um, It's actually constant, and it's it's very low compared with the intensity of the star. So it's not a it's not a solar radii environment. It's just a, a thin um, stellar envelope. But what I wanted to do was um, after showing you this this breakout, which is over energetic relative to the spherical case, I wanted to um, focus on the location where the shock is is breaching the stellar envelope and show you a, a simulation, this is uh, by another student, Ega Salbi, um, of the location where the shock is breaching the surface. And this is done at vastly higher resolution. So another two-dimensional simulation, but here what, what Pega has done is to capture the inflow of material towards the shock zone, which since it's accelerating towards the stellar surface, you see a curvature in its shape. So this is pre-shock stellar envelope. And in this simulation, you're going to scan along the surface of the star with the with the with the breakout shock. So the the location should be more or less more or less still 
think of it now. And the post shock flow is going to burst out of the star, and I want to show you what happens. We're seeing the initial conditions of the simulation, and in, in reality what we're seeing is a translation of the planar self-similar solution into the, into the two-dimensional coordinates of the, uh, of the star. Say it again. That's correct. Why is radial coordinate? It, it reaches zero at the initial stellar post shock. And x is an azimuthal coordinate, which is just location along the star, in the frame um, traveling along with this initial, with this uh, initial condition. And the um, because we've zoomed in enough to not see the curvature of the star. In fact, we've yes, this region is shocked. This region is initially vacuum. It will not be any longer. Yes, that's what you would have in a planar case. Let me show you. Yeah, I truncated. The, we truncated the outer portion of the of the solution. So you're right. In the planar solution, you would have a uh, a vertical or a distribution, you know, material in this quadrant over here. But we remove that because we refill it anyway with the with the um, dynamic. So um, after an initial transient, what you see is the the resolution of the simulation is actually much higher than the movie. What you see is the steady state flow, or at least quasi-stationary flow, in which, in which material is traveling in and then being cast away from the place where the shock is breaking out of the star in all directions, including along the stellar post shock. And that was a density plot. So you have high density material traveling, at, traveling off to the right, low density material traveling forward at the shock. Um, this is a picture of the compression rate, so you see the shock structure and sound waves in the flow and a snapshot of the final state. And what's important to realize is that materials, this is an adiabatic simulation, um, so energy is conserved and material enters the shock at a certain rate, which is the speed at which the shock is traveling around the surface of the star. Looks like that. Below the stellar surface, it's, it's deflected. Across, yeah. yeah. And then there's, um, there's acceleration in a variety of directions. Um, and whatever it is, it is, it is whatever the um, horizontal velocity of the shock is as it traverses the stellar surface. Mm -hmm. And it's assumed to be non relativistic. There's a couple assumptions. We've, we've assumed that we can zoom in on a planar region, so we assuming this is happening close to the stellar surface. We've assumed the flow is non-relativistic, and we've neglected radiation diffusion, and so um, we've assumed that the, that the region of the star is uh, optically thick enough to contain the flow. But given those assumptions, uh, the speed of the material as it comes in due to energy conservation has to equal the speed of the material as it leaves this zone. And so you get a spray of ejecta, including along the stellar surface, which in this frame is the same speed as the material comes in, and in the, sh in the star's frame, that means that the speed is twice the speed at which the shock is wrapping around the stellar surface, as long as it's non-relativistic. So to continue the simulation, at first you see a breakout, and then you see this wraparound, followed by a collision between this non-radial flow from the two sides of the star. And so this is a really generic feature of the um, of the production of an, an event by a, a non-spherically symmetric explosion. You get collisions of the ejecta with each other outside the star, which can then lead to new interesting phenomena. No. Well, yeah, the symmetry would be broken, but the event would still happen in a very similar sort of way. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, it could, in, even in 2D, it can, for instance, it can wrap around to the pole. It doesn't have to be a pole. Um, so this, this has a few interesting implications. One is that um, this flow is actually, an, if it develops, it's optically thick, and you don't get to see the stellar surface. And so you actually remove that portion of the breakout light from being seen by the observer. Um, 
Secondly, uh, this energy conservation prevents the acceleration of material through, for instance, relativistic speeds. You don't get the relativistic shock ejection because there's a new, um, there's a new speed limit, which is twice the pattern speed of the material traveling around the star. So that's not relativistic. And um, you get ejecta spraying off in all directions, which can change the early light curves of supernovae when you're looking into that material. And you get collisions outside the star, which then become a new source for X-ray imaging, possibly a source for the X-ray exos that you saw in the 2006 mission. I should mention just very briefly that this has implications for planetary collisions. This unfortunately is an uncredited uh, illustration on the internet, but this has implications for the removal of uh, atmospheres during planetary collisions. And uh, just to give credit where it's due, I should also point out that this was, this was realized by Lucasfilm between 1983 and 2004, although they didn't get the non-radial flows that are supposed to be leading to planetary collisions. Okay, so I'll stop there. Basically, um, the conclusions are that, oh, the conclusions are that um, these low luminous transients and especially low, um, low luminosity gamma ray bursts are probably uh, shock emergence phenomena. In order to power them, you need a, a significant amount of energy. And in spherical models, you can use, um, you can play with the density distribution in various ways, which helps somewhat. But to really get mileage out of your, um, out of your uh, low luminosity gamma ray burst model, you need a aspherical explosion. Once you have one, this, um, this non-radial flow develops around the surface of the star. And it does some things which, which eliminate uh, high, high energy emission, like it hides, uh, hides the photon flash and removes the production of, of high velocity ejecta. But then it also, um, also creates a new source for uh, X-ray emission um, after the material explodes. So I'll stop there.